Okay. Grip on this operation, Heather. That's bored. Green light, yes, sir. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to pick the law. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every member is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to pick the law. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every member is to go home safe. Sometimes can feel like a welcome a coping strategy that can actually be harmful to people dr corey newman dr newman thanks for joining us my pleasure glad to be here when people are clinically depressed they sometimes try to cope in ways that are not necessarily good for them in your opinion what's one of the most striking examples of a coping strategy that can actually be harmful to people who are depressed excellent question as your question implies, not all coping strategies are created equal. Some coping strategies are healthier than others, and unfortunately, some coping strategies are downright harmful. One, one such harmful coping strategy is something called self-medication, which refers to a person's attempt to use alcohol, street drugs, or inappropriate con controlled substances, such as painkillers, in order to feel better temporarily. Dr. Newman, can you spell out some of the hazards of engaging in self-medication? What can happen to people who engage in this faulty coping strategy? Let's look at alcohol use for starters. It's well known in our society that people sometimes use alcohol to drown their sorrows, as the saying goes. Movies depict this all the time, and they often try to make it look pathetically funny, but really it's no laughing matter. Although alcohol can feel like a welcome anesthetic at first, it is actually a central nervous system depressant. Thus, the ultimate effect of using alcohol when you are depressed is to feel even more depressed, especially if alcohol is used frequently and excessively. People get trapped in a pattern where they drink to ease their pain, then they feel worse, so they drink more, which makes them feel even worse, so they drink more, and so on and so on until it becomes a serious problem, both in terms of the drinking itself and the depression, which gets worse. Okay, and how about the issue of people using inappropriate medications, street drugs, in order to self-medicate? Well, it's very similar to what I just described about alcohol use, only there can be even more complications because the inappropriate use of a controlled substance like painkillers and the use of street drugs is also illegal, which can have its own awful consequences, and that's just going to make people more depressed too. Further, the dangers of overdosing are significant, especially if these drugs are used along with alcohol. In fact, about half of all suicides, whether accidental or intentional, are related in some way to al alcohol and other drug use. A depressed person who is not suicidal while sober might, in fact, suddenly and impulsively decide to kill himself if he is in an altered state of mind owing to drug use. And similarly, a depressed person who believes typically that she doesn't have the gumption to kill herself while she's sober 
may decide that she can get into a deadlier state of mind if she drinks and uses drugs because that way she won't be thinking about the pain involved in the act of suicide or thinking about the future that will be lost or about the horrible consequences for loved ones who she leaves behind. When depressed people are also chemically impaired, they are almost certainly not in their right minds and therefore their decisions can be traumatic and deadly. If self-medication is as harmful as you describe, why do people do it? There are lots of reasons. First, self-medicating seems like the quick and easy thing to do to get instant results. For example, drinking a bottle of vodka to temporarily blot out your suffering because your wife just left you seems quicker and easier than dealing with the consequences of readjusting your life as a single person. And it also seems quicker and easier than making an appointment to start therapy and doing therapy. People, by and large, are very responsive to things that are quick and easy. We respond to immediate gratification. This is especially true if we feel depressed and we don't believe that we can hang in there and cope for the long run. Unfortunately, as all too many lessons in life show us, the thing that is quicker and easier often is not what is better. What is better would be to do everything possible to maintain a clear-headed state of mind so that you can make good sensible decisions that will improve your life. What is better is to engage in healthy things, such as spending time with supportive friends and family, exercising, uh, educate, engaging in work, school, hobbies, committing to an appropriate course of treatment, uh, whether it's therapy or medications or both. Well, Dr. Newman, since you mentioned medication as a treatment option, let me ask you this. How is taking prescribed medication for depression any different than engaging in self-medication? Aren't they both examples of using chemicals to feel better? Why is one method okay and the other not? You know, I'm glad you brought that up because all too many people have that same question and it rarely gets discussed the way it should. So here goes. If a depressed person goes on a medication that is specifically prescribed for depression, in the context of that particular person's medical condition and history, then that is not an example of self-medicating because it is a well-targeted, well-targeted, individualized treatment that is supervised by a medical professional. Not only that, but most medication treatments for depression do not, do not reduce the patient's functioning capacities the way that alcohol and street drugs can. To the contrary, the proper medications can greatly improve a depressed person's functioning so that they can live a more normal life and be more effective in meeting their obligations as students, employees, parents, partners, and so on. Contrast that scenario with getting wasted, you know, self-medicating, where the depressed person misses school, misses work, drinks the family paycheck, fails to pick up the kids, gets uh, pulled over the police and charged with DUI, and winds up in an ER or county jail. Okay, but what about the cases where depressed people are on properly prescribed medications and they use alcohol and other drugs? What happens in those cases? It's often the case that when someone is on antidepressant medication, they are instructed by their physicians not to drink. And, and it goes without saying not to use illicit drugs as well. Alcohol and other drugs, aside from their own potentially harmful effects, often interfere with the proper action of antidepressants. Therefore, if you think about it, it's somewhat self-defeating to take an antidepressant on the one hand and then to drink a depressant like alcohol on the other. I've encountered patients who told me that they were going to go off their antidepressant medication because they thought it wasn't working. My response, knowing that these people were also regular drinkers, was that they were getting rid of the wrong chemical. They should be going off the alcohol, and then they might have a chance to see what the antidepressant medication could really do without the interfering effects of the alcohol. So if the proper treatments are not quick and easy, how are people who are deeply depressed supposed to hang in there and do the better thing, which is to wait longer periods of time for more appropriate treatments to kick in? Fair question. There's no answer, no easy answer for this. The reality is that quick fixes for clinical depression are an illusion. Real improvement requires sustained changes in a full range of habits, such as thinking more constructively, getting the proper amount of sleep, eating healthy, exercising, doing meaningful activities, 
interacting with others, and of course, adhering to proper treatment, such as cognitive behavioral therapy and perhaps antidepressant medications. Although this does take some time, the positive changes will be more solid, more stable, and more meaningful. That's the best medicine, so to speak, even though it does take some time. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Thank you. You've been listening to my conversation with Dr. Corey Newman. Nonpartisan Liberty for All. I apologize. We're having some trouble with my main microphone. Um, Sorry, you're going to hear some... trying to get this uh i have multiple mics in the studio motherfucker all right let me play something real quick and we'll be right back uh i apologize but for some reason my main microphone is not working all of the sudden um of course it was fine on whatever the last show was which was thursday and today it is not. So we're going to go to a clip. And when we come back, I'm going to try to get this straightened out. The only reason uh, I'm having uh, an issue with the microphone I'm on now is because I'm like, it's placed uh, totally differently on a scissor arm. And I had to pull it from like around the side of the room And I have to be near the computers, obviously, and the mixing board. So I'm sitting here trying to pull this over. I do have another microphone that's on a stand, and that one would be fine to use. However, for some reason, that one is not working as well. So let me play this clip. Uh, Either way, we'll be back on some microphone and we'll be able to do the show, but uh, it really frustrates me and kind of throws me off when my main microphone, for whatever reason, all of a sudden goes out, and then I'm panicking to get it to work. Um, But we'll be back uh, right after this, and uh, thanks, everybody, for bearing uh, with us uh, here on Nonpartisan Liberty for All, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. Hey, an alien. Yes, I've travelled across space to check on the progress of your species. Cool. Shall I take you to our leader? Your what? Our leader, the guy in charge. The guy in charge of what? Well, in charge of everything. You have one guy in charge of everything? No, no, he's in charge of government. What is government? Well, government makes the rules for us. It tells us what we can do and what we can't do. So is government really smart? They come up with wise rules for you to follow? Well, mostly. But some of its rules are really stupid. Do you disregard those rules? No, we have to follow the rules, even if they are stupid or we disagree with them. Government punishes anyone who disobeys the rules. So you are slaves to government? No, 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 it's not like that at all. Government works for us, the people. It serves us. We're the boss. It tells you what to do, and it punishes you with violence if you disobey it, and yet you're its boss? Yeah. But there are some things government does that you don't like. Well, yeah, not everything government does is popular. Like spending on wars, for example. What is a war? It's when government basically spends the people's money on weapons and soldiers and then sends them over to the other side of the world to kill a bunch of people over there and destroy their country. I don't like it that government does this. Well, I can see why you might not like that. Have you humans reached the stage where you generally consider stealing, enslaving and killing each other to be bad things? Oh yeah, we know that. Don't steal, don't attack, 
don't assault. But you give money to government and they use it to kill people. Well, yeah. But government does good things with tax money as well. Why don't you stop paying for the things you don't like and only pay for the good things it does? No, we can't do that. You can't just decide to stop paying taxes because the rules say that everyone has to pay taxes. But the rules come from government though, don't they? Yeah. So government made a rule which says that everyone has to pay them money. So everyone pays taxes because if they didn't, government would punish them using violence? Well, yes, but most people don't mind paying taxes. Most people feel obligated to pay taxes and obey government laws because it's for the good of society. Society needs government and that means we all have to pay taxes. So just to make sure I've got this straight, government makes the rules and you feel obligated to follow the rules, even the ones you don't like, and it tells you what to do and threatens to punish you if you don't do what it says, and it uses some of the money that it's taken from you using threats of violence to pay for things you don't like and actually think are immoral, like mass murder. Yeah, but we can ask it to please tell us to do smart things and please don't take our money and use it to kill people. We're allowed to ask them to tell us to do what we want them to tell us to do. Are you guys just scared of this thing? Is government some huge monster that can just squish you at any moment if you disobey? No, government isn't a monster. Well, what is it then? Could you draw me a picture of it? Government isn't really the sort of thing you can draw a picture of. Maybe you could take me to it. Where is government? You mean the building? Government is a building. No, but the politicians who make up the government have buildings they work from. So government is a group of these politicians? Yeah. OK, so what species are these politicians? Well, they're human. Like you? Yeah. So politicians are humans and they're government. You're a human, but you're not government. No. So it's the politicians, they're the ones that boss the rest of you around and make you do things you don't want to do and take your money using threats of violence. But even though you're all humans, you're not allowed to boss them around and take their money? No, they'd put us in a cage if we did that. But look, it's not like the politicians can just do whatever they want. Like, a politician can't just come up to me on the street and make me give him money. They can't do that. Politicians can only do things like that in their job, when they're working for government. Oh, so politicians aren't government. They just work for government. Yeah. OK, so government isn't a monster and it isn't a building, and it's not politicians, it's something else. And it employs politicians, who are just regular humans, who get to order everyone else around and take their money. How does a regular human become a politician? Well, that's the great thing about our government. It's a democracy, and that means that the people actually have the power, because we get to decide who among us get to be the politicians. We get to vote. And if a politician starts doing things we don't like, we can just replace him with someone else at the next election. So the people that get chosen to be politicians only get to boss people around and take their money for a short time, and then they go back to being regular humans? Exactly. That sounds like a powerful position to be in. But if you get to choose who does that, I assume that politicians are always the wisest, most honest caring and respected people among you? Well, no, not really. I wouldn't say politicians are known for being honest, or wise, or caring. And they're certainly not the most respected people among us. 
Come to think of it, most politicians are lying, power-hungry crooks. The ones you chose? Yeah, they're always doing things we don't like. They use taxpayers' money to enrich themselves and their friends, and they never keep their promises to voters. They've been caught stealing and lying and taking bribes, and they mostly do what the big corporations want. Yeah, they're always doing stuff like that. They're completely corrupt. They're a bunch of lying crooks. But you said that most humans know that stealing and beating each other up and killing are wrong. And you said that you have the power because you can change who's in charge. So why don't you just replace the lying, thieving, murderous, crooked politicians with some regular people? Well, we don't try to elect lying crooks. It just always turns out that way. But we have to have a government because some humans are nasty and might kill or enslave or steal. Civilization just couldn't survive without government. Let me. Nonpartisan liberty for all. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username: Nonpartisan liberty for all. Nonpartisan liberty for all. So I apologize for all that. Totally my mistake. The mixer, which has two power uh, buttons to turn on in the back, was not totally turned on. For some reason, uh, one of the mics, probably because it's powered by the other side, was working and I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So I apologize for that. And um, sorry that... I had to waste uh, all that time. Hopefully you uh, got to listen to the clips that I played and, and that uh, you hopefully enjoyed them. Um, but that wasn't uh, my plan there. So hopefully you stayed with us as well. Uh, so thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. <laughs> I'm your host, Dave Vaughn, and it is September 6, 2016, and we're coming to you live from Las Vegas. Again, thank you for uh, staying with us and tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday, usually at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern, and you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com and to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty For All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And, of course, we're always happy to hear from you. Our phone number is 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or you can call in via Skype. Username, Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Just send us a user request uh, or a uh, friend request, whatever you want to call it, and we will accept you and just uh, give your name and what you want to talk about. And definitely check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All, where there are original articles as well as the majority of the archives um, and other things there are social media uh, links, links to uh, all of our contact information. If you missed the phone number or the Skype uh, username, that's all there as well. So you can get all that information and more at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. And again, I apologize for the stupid issue. Um, <laughs> that was just an, I was like, I know this is just an obvious f fucking thing here. And it, it, what's unfortunate is. Uh, Thursday's show did so well, and I'm glad we had talked about, and, and I got uh, messages for this, but if you listen to the show, I clearly say that most people that I've heard pronounce it Crotum, because uh, we did a show on the DEA, which is Schedule 1-ing, 
Kratom, but I said that I think that sounds stupid, and I'm going to pronounce it Kratom. So that was something that I had said, and then somebody had mentioned, uh, they said they mentioned it jokingly, but that um, they want to tune out because the way I'm pronouncing it or whatnot. And then someone had said uh, that their wife is from Thailand or they had been to Thailand and the way to pronounce it, I'm still not sure from how they typed it because it's hard to type a pronunciation. So I call it Kratom because I think that sounds better. And, you know, you can get that, I guess not really, because I think if it would if you follow proper English, although English can be a fucked up language um, as far as how things are pronounced, but it would have an E. Um, so it would be K R A T. Oh, wait, K R. Yeah, T E O M. But then that would be like Kratinom. I don't know. I call it Krat- Kratom because when I first got it, and I never heard anybody pronounce it. That's how I pronounced it, and it, I like to pronounce it that way. So if it annoys people or they get offended, um, uh, that is not my intention. Um, that's just how, you know, how and why I pronounce it that way. But I did say that at the beginning of the show, just for the record. So... Tonight, we're kind of going to build on that a little. One of the reasons why I chose the topic for tonight was because of the fact that uh, we had talked about the DEA and Kratom on Thursday's show. And a lot of what people are doing with Kratom is in a way self-medicating, getting off of other drugs, which I have no problem with that. I think that's fine. I think that will cause more people or help more people to get off more dangerous drugs. And the only reason why a lot of those drugs are more dangerous is uh, partially because of the government anyway. And people don't Uh, I think, realize that or or think of it in that way. But it's a whole big fucking thing. I mean, I look at doctors now the way I look at lawyers. And I've had, unfortunately, a lot of experience with the legal system and how fucked up and corrupt that is and how there is no balance of power uh, for people that think that there is actually a balance of power somehow within government. Remember, saying there's a balance of power in government is like saying that there's a balance of power in a corporation. It it, it doesn't... It, well, I guess you could have a balance of power, but not when it comes to... Not in in terms of what we're saying. Checks and balances. You know, you don't have checks and balances within a corporation as far as... Yeah, they have lawyers and stuff like that. But when it comes to their goals of making money, they don't have somebody uh, that's going to make sure, you know, they, they're all uh, there for the same goal, essentially. So that's what go- I mean, government is a corporation in itself anyway. So, uh, I mean, that's what government is. And I had mentioned before, the only way you're going to get a separation of power or a check on government, you're not going to get a separation of power. But the only way you're going to get a, um, and I mean, within, yes, they have internal struggles. They all fight each other and all that. But they they still all have, I mean, it's the same goal, even though, you know, who has more power or who has more say or this person fights with this person or hates this person. You're not going to hear any of that. And and the goal is pretty much the same anyway, um, no matter how they want to look at it. But when it uh, the only way to have a check and balance, and I had said this, is if the people had an army comparable to 
the New York uh, Police Department just because they're huge. That would be the only way because that way when they pass a law, they know that the people might have something to say about it and they have to listen. Right now, they don't fucking listen. They don't care. Uh, just like when police kill people, it doesn't matter. Who cares? I mean, when it comes to them, politicians aren't responsible to anybody. I know you say, well, they get voted in. Yeah, well, those hundreds of thousands of people that vote them in and money controls it all, as do the political parties. And it's a totally rigged system, especially on the federal level. But even if you look at it on depending how big your city or county is. Uh, I had mentioned before, you know, the whole uh, Clark County Commission in Las Vegas. I mean, it's pretty much a rigged thing. The federal government, if you look at their budget, is very involved. And the the federal government controls the states by controlling funding. So if you say want more money for schools, and this is how they got everybody to adopt Common Core, those who don't know about Common Core essentially – it's federal school standards it is pretty much what it is. Um, now, that doesn't um, that doesn't mean that they had to adopt them, but essentially they blackmailed the schools by saying, we'll give you extra money if you if you use if you adopt these standards. So they do it with everything. So they control, I mean, that's one way they control the states, but that's a major way. I mean, they also get involved in elections of governors and all of this. The political parties get involved and they they have money coming in from other states. It's not like um, all the, the money when it comes to a governor's race or uh, state assembly or... Uh, state um whatever you have in your state some of them have some states have state senates um and and state representatives some have state assemblies and state senates um so depending on what you have um and what state it is and they may get involved in those too um the it just so happens in nevada uh the biggest county in the state uh, which is probably like 70% of the population, at least uh, 60, is Clark County, and, and they're heavily involved in that. And, and of course, Clark County produces a lot of money. Um, well, they don't produce shit, but the casinos produce a lot of money. And, of course, from that money, the there's taxes that the um, the... Clark County Commission uh, collects. I'm sorry, I'm trying to adjust my mic here because earlier when I was fucking around, I messed up my levels on my actual mic. I don't think that volume thing matters, just my gain. So, see, this is my gain turn way up, and this is, I don't really use the gain on the mic. I think I just had it in the middle. But anyway, um, want to make sure that that sound is nice and clear for everybody. So I was going to talk about a couple messages I got on one of my Facebook pages that I barely have any likes. It was very weird. Uh, but being that we're at a challenge for time now because of the issues in the beginning, I'm going to get right into it. So tonight we'll be talking all about uh, self-medication uh, or self-medicating, meaning you using whatever you feel is appropriate um, to deal with whatever issue you're having as opposed to going to a doctor, which they're controlled by the government as well. And how are they controlled? Well, they're heavily regulated, especially now when it comes to prescriptions and things like that. Also, at this point, all of their data is actually put into a database. So when um, Obamacare passed, the part that I read, and which is impossible to read, and, and I'll tell you why, because everything 
not everything, but the majority of things are to be determined later by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So you don't know, and you have to go find all these addendums and things like that. And I couldn't find them. So I read the original bill, which was like 1,100 pages, and I didn't read every single page. Um, What I did was kind of scan through some stuff and read the things that I was concerned about, mostly that had to do with how the government would track uh, people, medical records, um, anything to do with mandates of other things. So there's a couple of things uh, there that allow the government in, in the bill, essentially it allows the government to look at things like outcomes. So even though they would take your records anyway, just like they spy on everybody and uh, store their records, even though they would do that anyway, they actually gave themselves the permission. You like how like that, that they gave, they give themselves permission in the bill to, to do this. And I, I don't even know how to, uh, really get into a explanation of that except for the fact that it just the way government works um sickens me but they put in there that they would check you know outcomes and all data had to be you know they had to set up all the records electronically and all of that stuff. And my doctor had told me initially they had to do it if they wanted to accept Medicare. But then I found out that no, they essentially every doctor has to have electronic records and they changed the billing codes for a reason as well, because they changed from like some ridiculous number. uh, Like, I don't know. They had a lot and I totally forget what number they changed from, but it, it it's in It would be like changing from like 10,000 to 500,000. I mean, it was that type of ratio and what they added. And and the reason why I believe they added them is so they could tell what was wrong with you easier by just looking at a billing code. So the billing codes were more specific. So they, you know, more knowledge about you by not having to look into details. So it could be part of your, you know, if they want to list out your uh, what's wrong with you or your illnesses or prior illnesses, they can do that. So I'm taking kind of a long way to get to this. And just so people that don't know, I just want to mention this real quick as well, that they have, uh, they established, I forget the fucking name of it too, because it's been a while since I looked at it. it. Essentially a committee to come up with what uh, procedures or what checks people should get. And of course they're all recommended and, and they're all covered by insurance. So it's kind of like, okay, we're going to make a list of what we believe you should get and it will be covered by insurance and it's bureaucrats that are coming up with this bullshit. And I believe, I mean, it was ridiculous shit. It was like, you should get an alcohol screening. Girls should get a, or women and girls should get a, um, females should get a, um, what did they call it? A, uh, abuse, um, check to see if they were physically abused by their boyfriend or husband or, um, you know, I guess parents, whoever, that they should get that uh, once a year screening. I think they called it a screening. Whether or not that they admitted uh, or admitted is not the right word, but whether or not that they brought, brought it up, they should just do it. So what I believe is that at some point, what they're going to do with this shit is they're going to make it mandatory or your insurance is going to be ridiculously high. There was a video where uh, they had showed a mock uh, ordering of a pizza where they had all the guy's information right there. And because of his health records, for him to get a regular pizza, it was like, you know, a hundred bucks. 
But if he ordered the special healthy like spinach pizza or some shit like that, you know, it was like 20 bucks. So meaning that they would use all this information, you know, against you and they will. And that's just one way. So adding your medical records to that is or has happened. So they know um, if the government wants to come up with some kind of profile on you that includes your medical records. And I don't know what they did with the past stuff, if they have entered all that into their systems or, or what. But definitely anything since Obamacare has come, since they, you know, went to uh, computerized records. Uh, it will be on there, which is ridiculous. So it'll be there with the rest of the data that they're collecting on you. So they put in your social security number, which the whole point of a social security number is you want everything converted. Being somebody who works with uh, databases, you know, you want a unique number to identify everything by. So having that unique number allows you to convert a name because how are you going to, you know, a lot of people have the same name and then you're dealing with matching text items and stuff like that. And it gets complicated when you're retrieving data. But if you have something that is based on a number and everything is attached to something like a social security number, you just type in the social security number and there you go. And you have everything as opposed to, you know, trying to match uh, records and pull all these records and, and, and link them. Because if you can link everything by a unique number, then you're good. Um, so getting to the whole uh, self-medication thing, that was one of the things that people were doing with uh, Kratom in a way is one of the uses and that people are still doing is it's good or it's very helpful in getting off uh, drugs like heroin or painkillers or any opium um, related drugs and they don't like that and we talked about this all on Thursday because obviously it takes you out of their little uh, circle of control. Well, not little because it's big, but of control and having to go because this is what they do now. And this is what's really fucked up because they essentially do the same thing, but it's worse because they give you things like subutex or derivatives of the or morphine or whatever for heroin, um, basically opium related drugs that aren't are all natural and are not, uh, worse than, um, Kratom, but they'll essentially do the same thing, but you'll have to most likely pay money. Maybe depending on your insurance plan, it may be free or if you're on some government assistance or something like that, it may be free. But um, why do the same? What is wrong with just doing it yourself? And they want everything under the guidance of a doctor who essentially, you know, doctors, do they even really give a fuck anyway um they're governed by rules of the government a lot of doctors even got out of medicine because of obamacare and the there, there was a whole bunch of bureaucracy behind that as well that i didn't get into finding all those addendums but i know from other people and you know from uh listening to or reading articles breaking some of that stuff down and it i also know a doctor as well who said it was you know it makes things a lot harder and terrible and of course insurance has gone up um even at jobs at least at my job you know insurance has gone up but the amount of coverage you get has gone down so of course that makes a lot of sense 
And really, I think what they want is total government, you know, one payer system where insurance is free, but the government controls everything. And then they have a monopoly on it as well. And that's exactly what we want to stay away from. Because then you get into the, well, they have a monopoly, you have no choice except to deal with the service and the existing company and you have no uh, other alternatives. It eliminates choice and that is not a good thing. Um, So uh, essentially the definition of self-medication is the use of medicine without medical supervision to treat one's own ailment. Now I'm, I'm not saying that this is good in every situation, I'm not telling people don't go to the doctor, just go and do your own thing. I'm not saying anything about that. It depends on the situation, of course. Um, You know, people can do damage by doing that. However, again, I mean, after Obamacare, now nurse practitioners who didn't go to medical school can do all the same things a doctor can do. Um... When it comes to mental health, and we'll get into this, there's not a lot of stuff, especially if you go to your regular doctor, but even the psychiatrist, I mean, it's trial and error. And I know because I have somebody, you know, a mental illness in the family, and they don't know what's going to work. They don't know if it's something's going to work. So when it comes to something like that, and I'm not saying if you have a serious mental illness to go out and and try to find something that's going to help you, but what I'm saying is the doctors, they're not as um, knowledgeable on mental issues as you might think that they are. And these are the, you know, plus you constantly hear things change all the time and it depends on you know a lot of things are just bullshit because you'll have this study and this study and then a new study will come out that will supposedly contradict this study and a lot of that is just you know studies are done and I've mentioned this you know based on the people doing them always have an agenda usually and they they have a paradigm they have a uh, I think hypothesis that they think this is what's going to happen, you know. And if you looked ever before at what they do with medication, how they test medication and its effectiveness, and it it doesn't sound to uh, especially men- um, I'm talking more with like stuff that has to do with mental illness. Um, it doesn't sound too uh, comforting, to be honest. But um, they, yeah, there's a lot they just don't know. Now, I'm not saying that I know because I don't, but I do know that there's a lot that doctors just don't know. They have a lot of patients. They don't give a fuck. They're tired that day. I, I don't know. I mean, it's essentially like, okay, I have this, and they give you some medication. I mean, doctors, a lot of doctors are medication-based. Um, you know, there are good doctors out there that care about what's wrong with you and want to help. Um, and there's different things that are obvious compared to things that are hard to figure out. So... Like if you have a broken bone, it's pretty obvious. You do an x-ray, you see that the bone is broken, and there you go. If you have pain coming from a certain area, you don't know why a lot of the times if it's, you know, say stomach pain and the type of pain, and that's the only pain you have, and sometimes you have it and sometimes you don't, or you have pain in wherever. There's certain areas that, you know, they have to do all these tests and they have to do this and that, and they're they're really just interpreting um, those results. But they're, when it comes to medication, 
you know, most doctors didn't invent medication, nor are they experts on it. I mean, they know more than the average person, but think about it. You know, doctors go to medical school. I'm sure they learn about medication, but most of what they're learning is based on other people's experience uh, and knowledge. And then you have the pharmaceutical companies that try to push different medications to the doctors to use. So they'll say, hey, if you buy all this stuff from us, you know, whatever, we'll give you, you know, and that's, of course, illegal, but they, you know, push for doctors to prescribe certain medication for certain things because there's a lot of uh, medications for different things, especially when you're talking about mental uh, things and pretty much that's what I'm. I'm talking more about, you know, when it comes to anything mental, whether it's stress or anxiety or depression, um, that and pain. It, because pain, a lot of the times, unless it's from something that they can specifically identify. And so I'm talking more of, I guess, unknown pain, meaning they don't know what the fucking cause is. So when it comes to stuff like that, that's where what I'm talking more about. And the other thing is, of course, that you have the right to self-medicate if that's what you want to do. And I can understand more and more people wanting to do that for one, you know, people might not think the same way I do, but I know that, and I do go to doctors, but um, that your records are out there. So if you're depressed or you have anxiety or you have some stuff, something uh, related to that, I personally wouldn't go to a doctor for um, or a psychiatrist, you know, for anything that was major. If it's just like I have anxiety sometimes or I'm stressed out uh, sometimes or whatever, that's one thing. But to go to a psychiatrist, um, I would try to avoid that because that's going to be on record. And then, you know, then it's, oh, well, you went to a psychiatrist for this and we're going to take your guns away now, or we're going to regulate this for you, or we're going to, you know, it's, I know some people will think that, oh, that's just paranoia. Yeah. Like people 10 years ago that thought that the government was spying on you, that was paranoia, right? So it's not because, all this data is being collected. And just because you don't know how at this point they're going to use it against you, and you may not, uh, there's, you know, hundreds of ways that they the government can use data against you, especially um, when it comes to your medical history, d- depending on what your medical history is. And it comes to your uh, mental state. Definitely when it comes to your mental state. I mean, that's something that's... They want to put um, your mental records in gun databases. Now, while I I understand... Well, I really don't because I don't believe there should be any restrictions on guns. And that goes back to self-ownership. You know, if you own yourself, you have the right to go out and own anything else. If somebody's mentally ill and they're and they want to harm people, they're going to find a way to harm people. So it it really doesn't matter how you look at it. Plus, there's plenty of people that are mentally ill that it's not documented anyway. But um. So I don't even believe that there should be a a database or a background check on somebody that buys a gun. Um, It is up to the gun dealer, I believe, because they have the right to say, I don't want to sell to this person. 
the same way that I think any business has a right not to sell to a person, but I don't believe that there should be any restrictions on guns. And I think guns and drugs are very related in, and and not in the sense that people are thinking like drug dealers got guns and they're going around shooting people. I think, no, I think in the sense when it comes to restriction and, and it's fucked up because most people don't think that way. Most people, or at least what they want you to think, at least party wise, you know, a lot of people that support guns don't support drugs and vice versa. And it's really similar in the sense that, and I know that it, it, people can just come out and say, well, eh, well, drugs, you know, when people do drugs, they're killing themselves and they're not killing other people. I, I know there's all these arguments as to why. But the main thing of being able to possess something and having the right to possess that is the issue. And being able to possess a gun or drugs or to be able to consume drugs or use a gun, um, I think they're both huge issues of freedom and self-ownership. Because if you own yourself, you are responsible for your own defense and protection, I believe. This fucking government bullshit that the police are... The police don't protect you. The police don't have an obligation to protect you legally. There's a Supreme Court decision. So you can't sue the police if people are beating you up and the police stand there and don't do anything. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, that's on a federal level, so the town or city that it's in may have their own policy and say, we're going to, I doubt they'll do this, but we're going to suspend you guys or may allow you to sue the town, but they can just throw it out because if they keep appealing it, they can appeal it up to a federal court and a federal court would reverse it anyway. So, it's not going to happen. The worst that can happen, the only thing that can really happen is that if the police commissioner or sheriff in that town wants to suspend the officers or, or um, you know, the, punish them because that goes against their policy, then they can do that. But besides that, they have no obligation. They have no legal obligation to protect you. So, and this is not why I believe this. I just believe that essentially you are born and not owed anything, really. Um, I believe your parents have a moral responsibility to take care of you to a certain point, And that's it. I, I don't believe that the government owes you anything, but I don't believe you owe the government anything neither. So, Looking at it that way, you're responsible for your own protection and safety. However, the government wants to try to restrict that. And that's a violation of, I believe, your human rights. And goes back to some someone who owns themselves has the right to defend themselves and their property, just like you have the right to defend your property. Well, you're your own property, so you have a right to defend yourself, and you have your the right to defend yourself using lethal force if necessary. Now, that doesn't mean you just, you know, have the right to just shoot anybody because they uh, looked at you wrong or something. You know, you don't have the right that the police have, I guess, you know, to just shoot people because you feel like it. Um, but you have a right if somebody's attacking you 
um, and they don't have to be armed. I, I think it's different when it comes to a trained officer and it comes to a regular person. But I, I don't want to get too much into this, um, especially with the time constraints. So anyway, I, I believe that it, they're pretty much part of the same. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but, you know, it's like if a cop's searching for something, it's usually guns or weapons, you know, things you shouldn't have, things that the government um, is looking for or trying to deprive you of or restrict more and more. So that's where I see uh, a comparison there. But anyway, my, my whole point is that you have the right to medicate yourself. Now, the government has taken that right away from you in many instances. Not 100%, of course, there are over-the-counter things you can buy, but they feel that if something is too dangerous, they have to play your parents and they have to make sure that it's not abused. And you also have to remember that, (laughs) one, it's just... And this just baffles me, but making laws just to protect the few and take rights away from the many is essentially what this country is totally based on and what they, how the country is run. It really is. And it's the few that uh, I had played a clip with a mother who swears her son committed suicide because of Kratom. And like it's her mission now, life's mission, to make sure it gets banned. And she was from Florida, and it did get banned in Florida. And you had the Mothers Against Drunk Driving to make sure that the punishments were harsh and do Things like checkpoints that totally violates people's rights, but the Supreme Court believes, and this is what they say, that, well, we know it violates your rights, but, you know, it's better to have your rights violated and uh, have more public safety. That's how the Supreme Court feels. At least that Supreme Court, uh, whatever year that decision was made, and I think it was in the 90s. And... The Supreme Court is all based off of um, political agendas and political parties anyway. So and and they're doing something that they weren't even supposed to do in the first place. So anyway, let me get into the details uh, of what I wanted to uh, talk about regarding this. So first of all, I mean, what even causes people to self-medicate in the first place? And, you know, part of that is. It might not be a huge issue or it might not be something you want to go to the doctor for or you don't want to tell the doctor about. There are all kinds of reasons why people self-medicate. Alcohol is probably the biggest drug when it comes to self-medication because it's readily available and it's... It can really fuck you up. Um, And I believe that alcohol... See, this is why, you know, all arguments of the government when it comes to drugs are not, you know, invalid. Because this invalid... The fact that alcohol is legal, but none of these other drugs are legal, invalidates any argument that they have. Because to me, alcohol is the worst drug there is. Now, I still think alcohol should be legal because I think all drugs should be legal. All substances should should be legal. That it's a person's right to choose what to put in their body. And we also, I mean, now that we have the Internet and there's so much information, you know, it's people need to be responsible for what they put in their body as well. So. This whole, it's gone more and more towards a direction of, well, somebody else is responsible for what you did. And I don't believe in that, even though, you know, 
you could blame your parents for certain things or you could blame the government. I could blame the government for a lot of things. I could blame people that I've worked with that have screwed me over or whatever. You know, I could blame people for where I'm at in my life that I should be further ahead. I mean, I do fine, but I should be doing better. And I can do all that shit. But when it comes down to it, you know, it's the choices I make that put me in the situations I'm in. Now, that doesn't mean that other things don't contribute, but it's still your responsibility to get through those obstacles and to deal with your own problems. And, you know... There are cases where you could say, okay, they had no control over that. How you, how can you blame them? Like there's some people that have went to jail for murder and they find out 20 years later uh, from a DNA test that they weren't the person who uh, committed the murder. You know, there's things like that that happen and it's hard to put the blame on them and and things like that. But, you know, people could say, well, that person might've been a person who got into trouble or hung around with the wrong people or whatever, but still, I mean, that's kind of irrelevant in, in that sort of uh, scenario, but in general, people are responsible for their own decisions. So if you, if you're on a drug, you know, like they want to blame, uh, doctors, and this is an, an area where I will defend doctors, but they want to blame doctors for giving out, you know, too much painkillers. I blame doctors for not giving out enough, and I'll tell you why. Because you have people turning to heroin. It, 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 people think of this the wrong way, and I've done shows on this, and this is the same thing that we talked about uh, when we talked about uh, Kratom or Kratom for those who don't like me saying Kratom, but this is the same issue that, and this is what's going to fucking happen with, with Kratom is people that are using Kratom right now, regardless what they're using it for. So some people are just going to not use it and not replace it with anything else. They're just going to be like, fuck, uh, or they'll, you know, try to get it illegally Uh, but I don't know when a drug goes from being legal to illegal, how the market is going to react to that. So meaning are people going to, especially something that you have to import. So there's going to be a whole bunch of it that's already been imported, um, sitting around. So, Will that end up hitting the streets or not? I don't know. Will drug dealers even see a market uh, for that? You know, who knows if it's going to be available at all or if people are going to start trying to grow it on their own and and who knows. But let's say for the purposes of what we're talking about, it's just it's gone. You can't get it, period. And there's going to be people that have leftovers And there's people that I'm sure are stocking up. It's September 30th uh, that it becomes uh, Schedule 1. There is a uh, petition you can sign. I don't think it's going to do anything, but I would still sign it. It's a White House petition. If you go to my show on YouTube, um, a bunch of people uh, put it there. Uh, My YouTube channel is Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And you'll find the show. It's right there because they're in the order of date posted and it was Thursday show. But you'll you'll be able to find it if you just search for it and search for White House petition on Kratom. But I, I would sign it anyway, as I did. But I don't think it's going to do anything, to be honest. Um, but this 30 day notice thing is just it's insane. I mean, it, it really shows. And that's why I hope that people that listen to that show and not only that listen to that show, but that use um, Kratom or Kratom, they realize 
or at least puts that thought into their head and they start thinking about government and how fucked up it is or at least open their mind to it so i mean i had got the most listens on youtube to that show that i have on youtube to any other show and this is from youtube um because i don't get a lot of listens on youtube probably because it's a radio show and you don't see any video um i get probably the most i think from spreaker it's on a bunch of different applications, but this is the one that I got the most on YouTube. Um, and I've only been on YouTube for, it's been less than a year. I know that, um, when I, uh, from Spreaker, it automatically posted it and it started doing that, um, maybe December or something like that. So it hasn't been that long. And again, a lot of the listens come from other places. So, um, I got the most listens to a YouTube show via YouTube that I've ever gotten. And I know it was because, you know, people saw something on, on Cray Tom and hopefully they liked the show and they thought about some of the things I said, because I guarantee you that you're not going to hear the type of, um, things that I said on that show or that I say on any show um, in most places, you know, there are some shows that are quote unquote more, or I guess libertarian. I don't consider myself a libertarian because I don't like any of, especially libertarian, but I don't like any of the words to describe, uh, how I think and feel because they've all been, uh, bastardized, but libertarian has, more than any other one but there's shows that that support true freedom and liberty there, there's a lot of them but i just think that i have a totally different perspective based on how i grew up in my experiences than any other show and that doesn't for good or bad i mean that doesn't mean that it makes my show a better show or even a good show i'm just saying it's just different um, so how people take that is how people take that, but whether they listen to that show and continue to listen to my show, and I don't know that they will, because I had another show that was huge. And then, <laughs> and the next show was like, you know, 10% of that. So, um, and it, and it didn't probably help me today that the beginning of the show got fucked up, but well, I really didn't get fucked up. It just went to, um, to clips uh, while I fix my microphone issue, which I, I usually don't have issues, to be honest. Um, and I'm really good at handling those now. Just I've been doing this show for over two years. So the longer it, it radio is the type of thing that the more experience you get, the better you get at it as opposed to reading and preparing not reading and preparing for the show but to be a, a radio host like there's things that no matter how much talent you have and how much you read about re being a radio host you, you're not going to learn unless you actually do it is what I mean so and, and I still have so much to improve on and so much to work on but anyway I hope that show turns into more listens for me but even if it doesn't I hope people start thinking about what government is doing because that is a perfect example of what government's doing. And and that's why I wanted to do this show as well so I could refer to that also when it when it comes to self-medicating. So I was saying what would happen with uh Kratom if it goes away. And and I think I mentioned this on the show there um as well, but we'll say for the purposes of this discussion that say it doesn't exist anymore, that it totally you can't get it anywhere. That that's not going to be the the case cuz like I said people can stock up and stuff like that, but I don't know if it will become something that drug dealers sell or something like that. But anyway, so people will go back to you know might end up doing heroin, may try to get painkillers, who knows? Because there's people 
I was saying there's people that just take it recreationally. They they'll probably just stop and, you know, maybe they'll drink or they won't do anything. Then there there's people that take it for pain and that they need something for pain, and there's people that took it or used it to get off of something else and they're still using it to get off of whatever they were trying to get off of some type of opiate. And what are they going to do? Those two sections of people are going to go to things like heroin and painkillers. And that's what I was saying with painkillers. Although I don't think that painkillers are that bad. I think that crate Kratom or Kratom is a lot better. But I think painkillers are bad. And this is what I was saying about the doctors, that they should be prescribing more because they're talking about all these heroin epidemics and heroin is definitely worse. But another reason that heroin is worse is because you're getting it from people in the street, street chemists, if you will. You're getting it you don't know what the fuck you're getting. Um, you can't trust who you're getting it from. Maybe you can if you've known them for a while, but they might not know, you know, they're getting it from somebody who's getting it from somebody else. I mean, it goes through so many pathways to get to the actual person that sells it on a street. So if you're somebody who's consuming it, not somebody who's selling it and buying, you know, kilos and pounds. But if you're somebody who's consuming it, you don't know what the fuck you're getting because you're by the time it gets to you, it's gone through like seven, eight, nine people. At least. So at least with painkillers, you know what you're getting and it's safe to a point. I mean, of course. That's up to you. I mean, if you take too many, you pretty much know when you're taking too many. Um, So the only issue I see with painkillers, to be honest with you. Now, when you get up into the like 80 milligram Oxycontins, that's a whole nother issue. Um, Although, of course, I think those should be legal. And if that's what you need, I think there's maybe some people are in that type of pain that need those or you just do it recreationally, but that's getting kind of high up there. Um, But still, I mean, your tolerance may be that high, I guess, but um, the only issue with them, there's two issues and Really, these are issues with self-medicating on things that aren't readily available. And it's that the price, because it's going to fluctuate, and being that it's on the street, um, if you're buying them on the street and not getting them from a doctor, is what I'm saying, Obviously, the price is going to be higher because there's risk associated with it and all these other things. And then there's the legalities of it that you could end up, you know, going to jail. Besides that, I really don't see an issue with painkillers even even being that bad the the bad part and i talked about this is the acetaminophen is worse for you which is legal uh, over the counter than uh, hydrocodone or oxy- oxycodone uh, as far as i'm concerned um because the problem for people that are addicted to it is not being able to get it or having to pay all this money to buy it on the street and that's with uh it, with any drug the the only thing is with those when you buy them on the street as long as you can identify them which i know if you go through like on the internet it's easy to identify what pills are luckily and they're so strict about it you know to identify them to make sure your prescription bottle matches what's in the bottle and all of that that it you know it 
has specific markings. I suppose people could try to, you know, fake that, but it'd be pretty hard. Um, but with anything else, the other issue is you don't know what you're getting. If you are getting heroin, and I've never done heroin, and like I said, I've never done any drugs besides I tried marijuana and, you know, prescription um, drugs, but it it, it would be – hard for me to do i mean i was never in the that stuff anyway but it would be very unlikely that i would touch any of that stuff just based on the fact that you don't know what you're getting people cut it um there's instances of people cutting uh, heroin with fentanyl, um, which I guess they're having an issue in Canada with fentanyl, and people ODing because they, um, when somebody ODs, they it become more popular. So their stuff, people automatically want to buy from them because they think their stuff is pure or better or gets you higher or something. Um, as I've been watching a lot of (laughs) drug shows, there was this whole thing on, um, Nat Geo on all these different drugs, uh, that happened to be on Netflix. Actually, it's Drugs Inc. And a lot of it is bullshit, meaning the way they portray the people and the way they portray the drugs, how bad they are and all of this shit. But I mean, you learn a lot about the drugs and and what's going on to an extent um again it's it's a lot of bullshit because it should all be legal and they don't sit there and bring up any of those points about the fact that you have a heroin epidemic is so they say there's a heroin epidemic because of painkillers but then they don't say well if painkillers were just legal, then there it goes. And like I said, before 1914, everything was just on the shelf. And that's what I'm worried about. Kratom, once it goes Schedule 1, assuming that it does, it will never be the same. If it comes back, it will come back regulated by the government. And I noticed this today, that everything or every time they talk about it, so-called experts or politicians or anybody or former politicians, because really politicians won't talk about legalizing anything besides marijuana. And even marijuana, you you won't get many politicians even talking about that. So the um, every time they talk about it, they talk about and regulate it. And that's what bothers me more than anything because I don't want the and regulate it. No. Put it fucking just like Tylenol. If you want to have somebody inspect it to make sure that it is what they say it is, if you want it to go through the FDA, although ultimately I think there should be independent uh, certification uh, places that check drugs and then there's competition and companies can choose who they want or they can have all of them or whatever. But that's in a totally free society and free market society. But I have no problem with the the FDA, you know, checking something to make sure it is what they're saying it is. Besides that, that's it. And like what they're doing with Uh, cannabis shops with the taxes and all the fees and all of this shit I think is ridiculous. There shouldn't be any, you know, it should be on the shelf at fucking supermarkets. If alcohol is on the shelf at supermarkets, then so should uh, cannabis and every other fucking drug. I'm sorry. So, and that brings us back to um, self-medicating. So, 
there may be people, it's like if you, if you have a stressful day, are you going to go to the doctor? Some people may go have a drink. Maybe there's some people that do illegal drugs. Well, I know there's a lot of people that will smoke a joint after work, maybe to relax them. Maybe they self-medicate. I, I actually know people that self-medicate for pain using cannabis because that's what works. And if it's if it's not broke, why fix it? So if you found something that works for you, especially with things like, like I said, like mental stuff, and that's what we're talking about, and unidentifiable pain. And most doctors, unless you go to pain management, and even then, if you have unidentifiable pain, meaning they can't uh, somehow show something to back it up. Like I have uh, really bad stomach pains and I have something for, uh, it's like, it. you can get it over the counter too, but I have the prescription one. It gets rid of stomach acid. Um, but I've had off and on really bad stomach pains and, you know, if I went to the doctor and said, I have really bad stomach pains, the chances of me getting uh, painkillers uh, aren't very good. And I had a, an issue that they couldn't identify uh, a pain issue where they couldn't identify the cause. And it was very painful. And... Eventually, I got something for it, but it took a long fucking time. And in all that time, I was sitting in pain, almost to the point where the pain was so bad, I wanted to die. Now, I've never actually said that before on the show. And, you know, I wasn't going to do anything about that. But I mean, that's how bad the pain was at certain times. And they still, I remember the doctor just saying, well, we don't, we don't give those out. And then I had to go through this doctor and this doctor and finally, you know, get to a pain doctor to get something to deal with that pain. So, and it's ridiculous and it's all because of this fucking system. Because on one side, they're saying that, oh, we're going to lessen the uh, punishments and, and the government uh, regulation of drugs. But then on one side, they, they're doing just the opposite. You know, they're they're taking drugs like marijuana and it's, you know, legal in what, five states now or six for recreational use. And it's medical marijuana in I don't know how many states, a lot. So, however, there's some restrictions I, I know in some states and I think including Nevada, they might have changed this, but you can't get a gun if you have a medical marijuana license, which is insane. So that's why I would say don't even fucking get one. Just buy marijuana and fucking, you know, be careful and don't get caught. But you have all these people that I noticed that, you know, supposedly for freedom telling people to get, you know, me medical marijuana cards so they can get their other rights taken away, to go through the government, to actually um, comply with the government and go get a medical marijuana card and go by their rules and get their permission instead of just doing it. And if I smoked marijuana, I would never get a fucking medical marijuana card. I would just do it. Um, it's never something 
I got in. So I had said that that the last time I I could probably count the amount of times I smoked it. And last time was like 20 years ago. Anyway, um, it's almost 20 years ago because I remember. <laughs> um, so but people may choose to self-medicate pain or stress via marijuana or cannabis is which is the real marijuana is like the i guess somebody said somehow that's racist because it it's what the government called it and it had to do with i don't know if it was native americans or whatever but cannabis is the proper name there but if you look at like my example of having to go through all this shit just to get medication for pain, and if you can find something that you can get on your own and you don't have to deal with doctors and it deals with your issue and it resolves whether it's a pain issue, whether it's um, anxiety or stress or depression and they hand out the fucked up thing is though doctors hand out uh, SSRIs like candy, and I think SSRIs are worse for you. And um, they give this not the same, but it, I think their withdrawal. I wouldn't say it's worse, but it's bad um, withdrawal from SSRIs. It's not. It's not like you don't get. Uh, withdrawal from these things and they're not even they're still experimenting with them i mean they're coming out with new ones fucking once a month some company will come out with one so they have so many and even the doctor they don't know what one's gonna work for you they'll give you one and then oh this one doesn't work so they'll give you another one and you know like I said, I had somebody in the family with mental illness who's gone through so many drugs and they worked for a little while, some of them, and then, oh, they changed this and this doctor gave this one, but this doctor gave that one. And that's not something I think you should self-medicate for, but it is something, uh, it shows how much they know about what they're doing. So if you find something on your own why not, you know, self-medicate? Or if you have stress and what works for you is having a six-pack, what is wrong with that? Now, I think that people should be able to do that with any drug. However, you have a monopoly on prescriptions that, one, that doctors hold, and you have to, it, you feel like, like I felt like a, like you're a drug addict or you're uh, something like if, if you're in pain and trying to get something that will help you with your pain, that you're like not a criminal, but you know, sort of, I mean, you have to sit there and ask for their permission and beg them to, you know, give you a prescription for something. So the government has given that power to them, but it really lies in the hands of the government because the government regulates them and goes through all their records. And I have heard that they even uh, limit the amount of patients that they can have that they prescribe uh, painkillers too. I mean, that's how fucked up has gotten. And it's not just painkillers though. There are other, you know, Sudafed, you have to be 18 and they limit how much you get. I know that's because people are cr creating crystal meth with it. So fucking what? It's just control of every fucking thing. I have a couple clips that I'm going to play. Um, I did get to play, uh, one of them, although I don't think I played the whole thing, um, while we were having some issues, but, 
I have uh, a, a couple others. So I'm going to play those and then we'll be back and uh, possibly I'll go a little longer um, because of the issues we had in the, the beginning. Um, and I did actually get to take a nap <laughs> when I got home from work. So I should be all right if I if I go a little longer. So so I'll play these uh, clips that have to deal with self-medicating and we'll be back right after this nonpartisan liberty for all and check us out at nonpartisan liberty for all dot com. Hi, I'm Dr. Nikolai Lennox, and I want to talk about a slightly uncomfortable thing. Self-medication. So what self-medication mean? Well, it generally means when we're using a substance, like food, or shopping, or alcohol, or medication, to change our emotional state. Now, the problem with that is it's usually not the right tool for the job, and it has consequences that produce things we don't want, and that's why it becomes an issue. How many of us, you know, after a difficult day think, well, you know, I've had a pretty hard day. I'm a pretty good guy. I deserve to have a drink today. I deserve to have some ice cream. I deserve cookies. I deserve a burger because I haven't had a burger in a while. And it's not really a response to an internal appetite from your body saying, I need these specific nutrients, which is an interesting state. It's more of a thing about I have an emotional thing I'm uncomfortable about, and I would like to take some substance to change or avoid that emotional state. And, you know, you know what I'm talking about, even though it's uncomfortable. What I'm telling you is this. And, well, before he tells whatever he tells, the bottom line is, yes, that does happen, and that's a good example. It doesn't necessarily have to be actual drugs that you're taking um it could be food it could be i have done that before got like mcdonald's or something because you know i was sad or whatever and let me go get mcdonald's and and eat that so it doesn't have to be drugs necessarily to self-medicate it could be anything, any thing you put in your body. Um, I guess the only other thing would be food, <laughs> food or drink. But what is wrong with that? Now, yes, in a perfect world, nobody needs anything. Everybody is mentally fine all the time and you know everybody's happy and whatever but it doesn't work that way people have stress people have anxiety people get sad people get depressed and people have pain um and sometimes it's emotional pain and sometimes it's physical pain and sometimes it's physical pain caused by emotional pain or some kind of mental uh thing can literally it's it it happens all the time it can cause physical pain and that's the cause of it and that's what i mean when i'm talking about to pain unexplained pain it doesn't have to be pain that's caused mentally but a lot of times it, it can be and while it not might not be the best way to deal with something some of these things if that's what you believe is best for you if that's what gets you by then i don't think there's anything wrong with it you know it's your life it's your body and you have the right to do what you want with it when it comes down to it you know, it's not them that's going to lose their job or them that's going to, uh, you know, fuck up a relationship or whatever might happen as a result of you not dealing with that issue. So you have to do what you have to do for yourself. 
and it's not hurting anybody else. It's not, you know, doing anything to anybody else. It's you and your body and you make those decisions. And like I said, I mean, if, you know, there could be worse consequences than, than doing that. You know, there's things that people have to do. There's people that have, you know, I personally don't have kids, but, you know, even dealing with that and then making sure you have to be there for your kids for whatever. And to be able to get by and I'm not I'm not talking about, you know, makes it sound like, say, alcohol and Oh, I got to go get drunk to go to my kid's thing or something like that. That's not what I mean. But what I'm talking about, if you have to release your stress by doing whatever you need to do so that you'll be in a, a, a good mind state when you need to be, then that's what you have to do. And you're, you know your body better than fucking a doctor or anybody else does. And really, despite what people say, you know what's best for you. And people are going to say, no, people don't know what's best for them. They do destructive things. And they do. And maybe they need to do some self-destructive things sometimes. Or they'll do something worse. You know, you don't know. But when it comes down to it, a lot of these doctors haven't been in the same situation or dealt with the same things. And no one's dealt with the exact same thing that you have, no matter how similar it is. Only you know what's going on with you. So I will listen to the rest of what he says, but I, I remember from listening to it earlier, it's not in the vein that I would support um, if my memory is correct. That behavior has consequences. We all know it to be true. You know that if you overeat a certain kind of food that isn't designed to be overeaten, or if you overdrink a certain substance that isn't designed to be consumed in large quantities, you're going to have physical and emotional consequences from it. So what I offer you is that sometimes when we have different symptoms that we're complaining about, maybe we have a neck pain, maybe we have digestive distress, maybe we have headaches, maybe we have... And I also want to mention that along with... The, there is more than just food and quote-unquote drugs, although some things that are classified as drugs are just fucking plants, so they're the same things. But I was going to say there's herbal substances, there's natural remedies, like Kratom, like uh, cannabis, even though the government, you know, doesn't approve those in most cases. But there's those as well. Um, and there's things like meditation or... um you know, other things you can do, the activities and exercise. And there's all that stuff that you can do that's probably better for you as well. But again, not everybody, you know, people are not perfect. And yeah, it, the best thing would be, oh, go running and do some exercises or meditate or do something like that as opposed to go eat something or go get a buzz or go, you know, whatever. But again, you not only have the right that the government doesn't recognize, of course, which uh, we'll talk a little more about that later, but it's your body. And some fucking doctor or health guru or whoever, they can give you advice and you can choose to take it or you could choose not to take it. But that's the whole point. 
more and more doctors and, you know, the government in general, but via people like doctors, lawyers as well, want to control your life. And lawyers do it in a fucked up way. I'm not even going to get into that. Um, Because they're all, even defense lawyers, are, they're all on the same team. And they make laws, so you need lawyers. You shouldn't need a fucking lawyer, especially for minor shit. But they create laws that way. They create laws so they have to be interpreted by a fucking lawyer. And it's the business of laws. But that's another show altogether, which I did a show on before, actually. But... It just comes back to, you know, you. And it doesn't mean, you know, people make mistakes, but it's your mistake to make. You know what's out there. You you could take the advice of a doctor who may or may not have your best interest in mind or just doesn't give a fuck either way. Now, most people have their best interests in mind, but sometimes they may not because they may, you know, be in a I don't care type of mood. But for the most part, it's again, you know, it's best for you. Nobody can understand what you're going through except you, no matter what it is. Nobody's in your shoes. Well, back pain. I'm going to be looking and seeing if there's something that we're doing on an ongoing basis that might be promoting it. And sooner or later, we're going to run across the uncomfortable area of self-medication. I have people who come to me who want to begin to change their lives and change their health habits, yet they're stuck on this issue. I don't have time to have good food, and they eat too much fast food, and as a result of eating too much fast food, they have the very symptoms that they're coming to me to see if I can help them with. And at some point, we sort of have to identify that as a form of addictive behavior. So what's addictive behavior? Addictive behavior is we get ourselves into a circumstance where we continually begin to do the things that don't work for us, don't solve the problem, yet we do them over again and again. And I'm not talking about the glamorous issues of addiction. I'm talking about the simple issues of addiction that exist in dietary stuff. Usually we find it in the forms of sugar. That's the most common thing. Or the, the glass of wine at night. You know, there's nothing wrong with a glass of wine at night. However, there are some physiologies that don't tolerate it very well. And that's not to say that they wander off into alcoholism. It's to say that when they drink alcohol, their body produces symptoms that are uncomfortable. Their neck hurts. Their middle back hurts. They get more inflammatory response. Their hormones get more out of balance. They don't think the way they want to think. And so one of the things we look at when a patient comes in to see us is, are you doing repeated behaviors that are in fact promoting your symptoms? And, you know, we can't always just start off on our first visit, on the first exam, and go right at that because it's uncomfortable. We have to wait for you to develop a certain amount of confidence in our relationship as doctor-patient before we address that. Because it's not about being right or wrong. It's not that you're wrong for doing that or I'm wrong for doing that. It's if we can identify the issue, then we can bring things to play that give us alternative ways of dealing with that. It is true, sometimes I will send people out for counseling because there's an emotional issue that comes out that people are trying to deal with in a dietary fashion. And that's just never going to work. Sometimes the emotional issues are there because the diet's so off that there's just not enough skill set left in the body to manage the stress of the emotional stress. So what I do is evaluate you and find out, is that a feature that we need to deal with? Are you, the patient, using substances to change your emotional state, oh, because you're tired, or because you're happy, or because you had a hard day, substances that are promoting the problem that you're asking me to help you with? And that's how we deal with sort of self-medication. You know, I medicate myself, so I behave differently, I feel differently. And that's not really the substance uh, that food is designed to be. Food is designed to nutrition, food is designed to give us nutrition. 
It's not designed to change our emotional state. So I hope this isn't too uncomfortable. We'll probably have to deal with it sooner or later, one way or the other. Thanks. My name is Cassidy Kirch, and I'm a part-time nanny. All my family's crazy pants, and um, and I inherited it, very luckily. Uh, so depression and addiction issues. I don't know that there was ever a time that I first noticed it, because I've always been depressed. I think I didn't want to seek help because I didn't want to ask for help. I didn't want a, a thing to be wrong with me. When I was a kid, my both my parents were addicts, and... Um, my dad got clean, but my mom didn't. So addiction is a symptom of a bigger problem. Um, so she had a lot of, she had issues with depression and issues with um, uh, bipolar disorder and all kinds of stuff that never got fully diagnosed because we couldn't, couldn't afford to see anybody. And then my brother and sister both have always struggled with um, bipolar disorders and and depression and all kinds of stuff and they can't afford to see anybody they can't afford to get medication so they self-medicate with drugs i remember one christmas um a bunch of bikers sort of stormed into the house uh, to deliver christmas presents which is a really aggressive way to do charity i think um, but also very thoughtful <laughs> um, and it was great. It was really nice that that charity existed. And I think that we were on welfare for a while. We got free school lunches or something. But it, it was a Band-Aid. It was like a little Mickey Mouse Band-Aid for kids, but like on a gaping flesh wound, uh, like on a, like a bullet hole or something. There are benefits for people um, who are living below the poverty line for food and for daycare, but that that's never enough. Um, but there's still nothing for mental health care. And my mom, who, she, my mom passed away a few years ago uh, of an overdose because she could never get the help she needed. She ended up in jail a lot because that's where you go when you need help it's where, and you can't get it. She never stopped fighting it. She never stopped fighting addiction and depression. And she, but she lost. I don't think that's, I don't think that devalues the struggle. But she wasn't lazy, she wasn't a cancer on the nose of society. She is just really lost and really sick. She just said something that is very disturbing in that she said she went to jail a lot because that's where you go when you can't get help. And the whole fact that she went to jail, not only went to jail, but she said a lot. And having, because she had a drug problem. And don't get me wrong, there are people that have problems with drugs. And I think... The definition of having a, pro a drug problem is when it affects your life and things happen that start to destroy or deteriorate your life. Like if you can't show up for work because of the drug or you treat your family badly because of the drug or it, it affects your relationships. Those are things that I think indicate having a drug problem. The fact that if it's something like you can't afford it or you go through withdrawal because you're physically, I see, I don't even want to say addicted because if you do something long enough, but you have uh, withdrawal from not doing something, I don't consider those an issue. I only consider those an issue because the fucking government makes it an issue. Because if you could buy drugs at the store, how many people 
fall into that category. So you have the people that say self-medicate and they have problems because they can't pay their bills because they're buying heroin or cocaine or crack on the street. I don't know why anybody does crack or cocaine. I did a a, a report uh, or a paper in college uh, in abnormal psych on uh, I wish I had the paper because I wonder what I wrote, but uh, I always thought drugs should be legal since I can remember since I was a kid, but as did my father. But um, what I read was crack gets you high for like five minutes and coke for like 15 or something. And I, I had watched um, or was listening to one of those uh, shows today where the guy said he got high like for like 30 seconds. And what is the fucking point of that? Anyway, I don't think the fact that it costs you a lot of money and you get withdrawal is an issue because it's an issue, but is an issue that you have a problem. You you have a problem in in the sense that yes or the or or that you're going to jail uh, would be the other thing because that causes you a problem but who, those are all examples of the government's causing the problem in my opinion when it comes to that if you can function and it doesn't fuck up your relationships you're alert you can do your job you can take care of your kids whatever and you take a quote-unquote substance that you can function fine on, but you have to buy on the street and cost you a lot of money, and you get arrested for it, and you um, go through withdrawal because you can't get it, I don't look at that as a drug addict in the same sense. It's your a drug addict caused by society in a sense. Now, those are all good reasons to stop or not do it. So you could say, well, society has has created an environment that makes that person uh, a drug addict because they have bad things happen to them because of the drug, but it's not really because of the drug. So I think the majority of people fucking fall into that, but because of government, you know, and, and and, and the reason why I don't think it's an issue and, and, and that, if drugs were legal, it wouldn't be an issue is that there are a lot of people who have problems who are self-medicating and that's how they deal. And maybe that's the only way for them to deal. And if they went to a doctor, they would give them something similar or they could, or they diagnose them as, you know, Uh, manic depressive or the anxiety or in this case she said they couldn't even afford to go to doc you know a doctor so just because you're taking a drug it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a good reason for that i mean essentially anybody who takes a drug that often more than you know a, a recreational user an illegal drug probably has you know there's always underlying issues there so they're taking it for something but the government is saying we're not going to allow you to self-medicate you're going to take what we determine you take even though again they don't know how you feel they're not inside your body they're not inside your head and if fucking you know cocaine or speed or one of i mean i don't know that you can function off of those um 
I don't know, or heroin or any of these. Um, and crystal meth just seems like it's a bunch of fucking chemicals and in, in that it shouldn't even exist. But when it comes to the drugs that come directly from plants and a lot of the chemical process is just getting them out and getting rid of the rest of the plant. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if that's, if you can function off of those drugs normally and it can help you with whatever your issue is. But if you can, I don't, it's not a problem. It's a problem because the government makes it a problem, but it's not a problem when it comes to it fucking up your life. Because the reason why it's fucking up your life is because the government made it illegal. If it wasn't illegal, it wouldn't be fucking up your life. So if that's the case, then I classify that totally differently than uh, opposed to somebody who is just a fucking mess dozing off, um, not going to work because they're, you know, doing drugs, fucking up their relationships because they're on drugs, um, th- not being able to function in society. That's a problem. So, you know, and putting people in jail for drug use is ridiculous. On the other side of that, putting everybody in rehab like some people want to do is ridiculous because if if you meet, I guess, the criteria that I just said, I don't think you need rehab. You need drugs to be legal because you may need that because of other fucking reasons and you're self-medicating. But if you go to a doctor, they're just going to give you some other drug. But then they get to control it as they have the monopoly on the prescriptions. So let me play the rest of this and then uh, try to finish up with some of the other points I wanted to make uh, before we end the show. And didn't have anything to help her get out of it because we didn't have any money, (laughs) you know? I think that the thing I always held on to when everything was at its worst was that it's not over. Whatever story or narrative arc your life is on hasn't ended yet. So there's more. And I I don't know if it's gonna get better I don't know if it's going to get worse. I don't know if it's going to turn around. But there's only one way to find out. <laughs> and it's to just keep on trucking through it. <laughs> I, I think that's the best thing that I can come up with, is that I always hold on to that. It's, it's not over yet. That lady ain't singing yet. Hi, I'm Jack Quaid, and Project You Are OK and the Harry Potter Alliance are teaming up to raise awareness about how living below the poverty line affects access to mental health care. If you want to join the conversation, use the hashtag MyHungerGames, or if you want to find out more information, go to projectyouareok.org. You're coming on to talk about something that most people are uncomfortable talking about with their family and friends. How did you make the decision to speak up on such a public platform? Well, that is exactly the reason why I decided to speak out about it on a, on a very open platform because there's too much stigma, stigma around mental illness and um, there's not enough being done to make mental health care more accessible to people. So my goal in speaking out about mental illnesses is that hopefully one day we can live in a world where mental illness is talked about frequently, people are educated, they're aware of what's going on, having compassion for one another and also knowing what to do in order to help people as well as themselves. 
opening up the conversation <clears throat> is so important because I think, and I think from a personal experience, you can touch on this. When you're going through something, it's so confusing that you don't know what questions to ask. So to be even afraid to bring up the conversation, it can feel um, probably really paralyzing. Absolutely, especially when you're young, when you're when you're a young adult, or even actually when you're older, when you don't know how to. I, for instance, when I was when I was younger. I was dealing with bipolar depression, and it was very severe, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And that's what I thought that there was something wrong with me. Little did I know that there was a chemical imbalance in my brain. And, um, and because of that, I, because I thought something was wrong with me, I never opened up to anybody. I didn't tell them what I need. Therefore, I ended up self-medicating and coping with very unhealthy behaviors. And now I feel like... I've gone through this journey for a reason, and I want to use my voice for more than just singing. I want to raise the awareness so that people can realize that there's nothing wrong with them. That it's just like a physical, um, I mean, it is a physical illness, it's your brain. Um, But, you know, it's just like diabetes. You, You have to find the right treatment for for what you have. It's a disease. And you're not broken. I think you're not that's... broken. And there's nothing wrong with you. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed about. Promoting the ideas of true freedom and liberty, nonpartisan liberty for all radio with Dave Bourne. Nonpartisan liberty for all, and we are back. Um, well, we were kind of back in between, but uh, I just wanted to make those points. And, and I know to some people, some of the things I'm saying probably sound ridiculous or stupid or whatnot, because everyone's been brought up to think a certain way, to think that. You shouldn't self-medicate. You should go to the doctor. These drugs should be illegal. If you're addicted to something or if you get withdrawal from something, it means you're addicted. Or using something uh, on a daily basis that's illegal is bad for you and all these drugs are bad for you. And and part of the reason um, the, other, the other thing is, that I think makes a lot of this stuff bad for you is again, the fact that they come from, you know, street chemists, you know, and that's been shown with, with opium that when it's done by, you know, pharmaceutical companies that obviously it's safer, um, and that, you know, anything can be abused, but they can uh, make things that help that are from the same plants and basically similar things. I mean, the, the issue with heroin is the fact that it comes from fucking the street and you don't know what you're getting. When heroin was legal... No one was fucking ODing on heroin. Um, no one, we didn't have these problems. Now you could say, well, yeah, that's a hundred years ago, but it's still a hundred years ago. You look at areas where people were so much fucking smarter. Why does it? And and you look at other areas where they were stupider. But why is it that? You know, over 100 years ago, or up until 100 years ago, about all this stuff was legal. And people could self-medicate. Now, uh, the doctor holds the key to everything. You need a doctor's approval. The doctor holds the monopoly on a prescription. Because they went to medical school for, you know, four years. And then the government, of course, watches doctors very closely, makes them go through, you know, jump through hoops, uh, 
they all have DEA numbers and it's it's really ridiculous. And of course, they have to pass all of the government's pass and comply with current regulations, um, not only go through whatever they have to go through to be for certification purposes, but also to have, you know, all these regulations. So I know what people say, what, you want to go to a doctor who's not certified? No, I don't want the certifications to come from government. I don't want government to have the monopoly on prescriptions via doctors. So how would I structure things if I was the, I could magically, you know, change things? There would be, and this would, this would be the case in almost uh, all regulatory instances. None of them would be mandatory, first of all. It would all be regulatory uh, agencies, you can call them that, companies that give their stamp of approval or not. The Better Business Bureau is not a government agency, yet we complain to it. We look at it to check out companies, but it's an independent company. Because what is the difference? Well, the difference is, is that in this scenario, you have competition. You have, if one company is fraudulent, you have other companies competing with them. Companies don't have a, if there's only one company, right? So there's only one FDA, there's only one, but let's just, never mind that, just say there's only one grocery store. There's one, right? What incentive do they have to give good customer service? None. What incentive do they have to make sure that their food is fresh? None. What incentive do they have for anything? None, because they know that you can only get food there. Now, of course, you could grow your own food, but let's pretend for a minute you can't. All you can do is buy it from this fucking grocery store. The same thing exists with the police, with the FDA, with the DEA, with everything that has to do with government. And what government's doing at the same time is they're helping out corporations so corporations can be the same way. Limited competition. Get rid of... You know, they'll pass laws. So each industry has uh, barriers to entry, right? If you want to get involved in the radio, internet radio, your barriers to entry are tiny. You need, you know, what, like uh, minimum maybe like a hundred dollars worth of equipment, not even, I mean, I'm saying if you want to do like actually sound good, but if you don't give a shit, you could spend $10 on a microphone, um, go to blog talk radio, do free half hour programs, I think. So I wouldn't suggest doing that. You know, I invested thousands of dollars in equipment and I found a site that, you know, I took over some of the stuff that I used to use blog talk radio, the sound quality. If you go back to some of my earlier shows, you can tell in two seconds, the sound quality now is it's not, if I had to rate it on a one to 10, I'd give it probably like an eight and a half. Um, I think the sound quality is very good. And I think I can get it better myself. To be honest, I can get it to like a nine and a half. And then you have, you know, professional radio stations that are better. But I mean, the sound quality is very good. I'm I'm fine with my sound quality. I, it, although I want to improve it, I'm, you know, satisfied. Um, but I still, you know, I have an effects machine that I haven't been using because hookup issues and whatever. But um. 
So, but you don't have to do that. So your barriers to, to entry are very low. Um, and even to do a quality show sound wise, your barriers to entry are very low. You know, if you spent, you know, maybe even a thousand dollars, not even 500 bucks and, you know, 50 bucks a month, or I spend like 65 a month, but that's going to go up because I'm going to get the 24 hour one because they're offering a 45% off for a year. So, um, I'm going to do that. And then a lot of these sites are free. So, and then I spend a little money on advertising and not much, but, um, in the future, you know, I'm going to put some more money into it, but really the, the barriers to entry are basically nothing. Anybody can do a fucking radio show, um, on the internet. Now, if you want to do something like open a department store, the barriers to entry are very high. And one of those reasons is because nobody can compete with a company like Walmart. And what happens is, and if you have seen the documentary on um, Walmart, I don't know if you'd call it a documentary on Walmart because it's not just the history, but what some of the stuff that was going on with Walmart. When Walmart comes to like a place that has nothing or just has a local, uh, they have department stores, but, you know, they don't have a Walmart. They put all the other department stores out of business because they can't compete price wise. But what they'll do is they'll give them no taxes for the first two years. Um, All of these government, you know, basically they might as well be grants or free money. I mean, if, and I don't, I don't believe in taxes period, but if, one business is paying taxes, but the other one isn't. How are you going to compete with that alone? Not to mention, of course, you know, all the other reasons why Walmart can have lower prices and laws that the government passes. So something like minimum wage, people don't realize they think if you have a business that you must be a millionaire. This is the thinking of some people. They don't realize that the guy making, you know, taking a salary of less than a hundred thousand a year, or maybe even fifty, because he's not um, doing that well, cannot compete with Walmart. And if he has to pay his employees fifteen dollars an hour if they up the minimum wage, he can't afford it. So he goes out of business. But Walmart, they can afford it easy. So a law like that, it helps big corporations. And people don't realize that. At the same time, it it ends up devaluing the dollar. So as it puts more money out there, it makes, you know, if, if anybody can make $15 an hour... It essentially, whatever you make is worth less. And prices will go up. And prices of all these places, of course, will go up because they're paying more money to the people working there. So it benefits big business. And it also, you know, when you have one or two big corporations, the whole free market, which free market really is just democracy. It's 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 voting with your dollars. But it doesn't mean anything when you have all these big corporations. When you have a lot of small businesses, it means a lot. Because 
if a bunch of people locally stop buying from a certain business, it's going to it's going to affect them. If a bunch of people locally stop buying from Walmart, it will affect that specific Walmart, maybe. But in the big scheme of things, it doesn't make a fucking difference. And I'm using Walmart because they're a huge company. So my point being is back to monopolies. The more competition, the better. Because people have to innovate. People have to do more for the customer. People have to make sure that they're good customer service wise, that they keep improving customer service, that they keep improving everything because you're competing with a whole bunch of other companies. When you have no competition, it doesn't make a difference because there's no place else to go. That's why the police are so fucked up. It's, well, one among many reasons. The, the real reason, of course, is the power that they have. But if you take all these government agencies, they're all monopolies. And if they're so good, like the FDA, how come all these tainted beef gets out? And you hear stories all the time of things um, getting out there that shouldn't have got out there. Because you have a monopoly on it. So the way that things would work with doctors and with drugs as well is that the government wouldn't be involved, period. You would have a bunch of different companies that would all compete for other companies' business. And if you had enough of them, and hopefully you would, they'd be scared to commit fraud because you say, well, what about collusion? Well, you could have collusion right now. You don't think that fucking companies pay off the government, all that, like the FDA or inspectors or whatever. It happens all the fucking time. And you know what? There's no way to, to have anybody else do it. So if one of these companies is corrupt or gets a bad reputation, then you cannot go. You could say, hey, I'm not going to eat at these restaurants if it's, say, restaurants that weren't certified by a different agency or a different company that certifies restaurants or drugs. I'm not going to buy these br- this brand because the company that certifies this brand, they were just uh, accused of uh, fraud and taking payoffs. So then that company will go and say, okay, let me get another, either they'll go out of business, the uh, brand of drugs, or they'll get another company to inspect them. Or companies will say, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna get all, say there's five different companies, ratings companies or whatever, I'm going to get that, all five to certify mine so you know it's that good. And now that we have things like the internet and information is so easy to get and you can get information from people across the country, I mean, and in your local neighborhood, if it only pertains to your city, a certain product, that there's no reason why that wouldn't work. And these companies would be forced to stay, you know, Um, uh, on the up and up. Otherwise, they would go out of business in all aspects. In the the companies, say, making, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies and in the companies that are checking them. So, and at the same time, you wouldn't have government making all these deals for big corporations, first of all, corporations are a government construction. It's not a a real thing. It's something that government came up with so they don't have liability. There's no personal liability. So without government, corporations don't exist. 
somebody's got to be liable. So that would eliminate corporations right there. I mean, there's so many things and, you know, I tell people I don't have all the answers to every little thing. How would every little thing work? But I do have a lot of them and I don't just come up with this shit on my own neither. I mean, most of the stuff is other people or other, you know, like the Mises Institute or something or, you know, uh, philosophers, libertarian philosophers and stuff like that who have come up with a lot of these ideas. And then you look at those ideas and how they would work in in uh, reality and, and explain them. And um, then you also build on those ideas and come up with, well, how do I think this would work or whatever? So um, that's how, to me, drugs would work and doctors as well. I mean... I would still have doctors go to school and and all of that. But doctors should be there to me more as you go to a doctor. It depends what the issue is. I mean, if you have a broken bone or you have uh, illnesses that they can test for and they know you have this illness and, um, you know, there's that stuff that's just it is what it is. And then there's the things where, you know, you shouldn't too many people just take their doctor's word for everything. And, you know, oh, it's the doctor's fault and and they blame the doctor, of course. But people I mean, that's a whole nother issue that, you know, you shouldn't just take your doctor's word for everything. You know, at the end of the day, it's your decision. And people have, you know, doctors have done some fucked up things. Doctors have been wrong. Um, you know, it, it's it's up to you at the end to do research as well. And yes, doctors are going to have more information, but they should be more of your counsel when you're trying to determine a health plan and what you should do to keep healthy. And, you know, if you want to self-medicate and say, fuck it, I don't want to have anything to do with a doctor because I don't trust them, then you should have the right to do that. And you do to an extent, but you don't have the right to, well, you, as far as I'm concerned, you have the right, but the government doesn't allow you to get what prescriptions you want or what you need. Um, no, you got to go and pay a doctor every time they give you something that doesn't work. So, I don't know. Um, you know, and then you have insurance that comes in and all that. But if you're willing to pay for some of these prescriptions, and that's where money could come in. But things like you know, painkillers and if they made heroin or cocaine or any of that would not be expensive because there's no fucking copyright on them. That's the other thing. Copyrights and intellectual property that makes this stuff uh, really expensive and it only lasts for a certain amount of time. But that should be the fuck out of there, too, uh, to be honest. I don't believe in intellectual property or copyrights. It's a bunch of bullshit. And and I could explain why, but not in, in this show. So uh, that's all for tonight. I apologize for the issue at the beginning. And I thank everybody, of course, for tuning in. And thanks ev- to everybody who tuned in to the show on uh, Kratom. I-, I guess the guy who had sent... Uh, someone from Thailand said he he made it sound like it was pronounced Kratom or Kratom because he had an E at the unless I'm misunderstanding. I don't know. Um, whatever. I'll call it Kratom because I, I like Kratom the best. But um, thanks, everybody who tuned into that show, because a lot of people did. And I appreciate it. And. And please, if 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 nothing else, 
I hope that it at least makes you think if you're somebody who hasn't thought about all the corruption in government and how government wants to control everything and how they're taking away all of uh, throughout the years. It to me, it's since the beginning, it's been a plan to take away all freedom and eventually get to a point where government controls everything. And if you look at not just through history, but if you look at all the things that are going on now as well, um, there's definitely a pattern and there's definitely something going on and what the end game is. I mean, the end game is to control everything, but exactly how, um, you know, remember, we got militarized police now. We got them spying on every aspect of your life. Um, you know, I I have been saying that they're putting in the infrastructure. But at some point, they're going to take that infrastructure and do something from there. So uh, just have an open mind and, and hopefully... Uh, People will continue to tune in. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, the economy and geopolitics with Ken Georgian. Thanks, everybody. And dangerous crime.